This is the lecture on comparing two means. This is going to be a quite short lecture, and the reason it's short is because there is absolutely nothing new in this lecture. What I mean by that is that every single thing I say will either be an obvious generalization of what we said about the confidence interval and hypothesis testing for a single mean, or it will be an obvious generalization of what we said for hypothesis testing and confidence intervals comparing two proportions. So we get to see all those ideas in slightly different contexts, or in a combined context is maybe a better way to say it. I'm going to start, as always, with an example. This is a study. The data is in, in a file called anorexiafix.xls. Um, it's a study of the treatment of anorexia. So the, the process was, there's a clinic and all the anorexic teen girls who came in seeking treatment in a given month were weighed and then were assigned to one of two treatments, either a family therapy treatment or a control group, and then they were weighed at the end of the treatment period. There's a white lie there. There's actually was a second treatment, a cognitive therapy. We'll talk about that later. We'll return to this example. Um, the idea here is you weigh them before and after the treatment so you can look at the difference, which is the weight gained. The weight gained is a measure of the effectiveness of the treatment. Right? The more weight they gained, the more effective it is. We've talked about control groups before in the context of lurking variables. The reason is particularly striking here. You can imagine that uh, girls coming into a clinic have recognized that they have a problem and are want help fixing it. They have they are eager to um, gain weight and uh, and cure their anorexia, which is not true of everyone who has anorexia. And it may be that simply recognizing you have a problem and seeking help is beneficial in itself. It may be that most patients in that situation gain weight. So merely looking at the weight gained would not tell you anything about the treatment unless you compare it to people not getting treated. If there's a difference between the treatment group and the control group, it can only be because of the treatment. So we're going to compare the average weight gain under the family therapy treatment to the average weight gain under the control treatment, no treatment. So the data for the weight gains, we'll take a look at this in a moment, are in columns I and H of that file. We're going to use that data, two columns of data, because we have two samples with numerical data, to test the claim at the 5% significance level that the average weight gains under the two treatments are different, there's some difference, and to give a 95% confidence interval for that difference. Uh, the relevant parameter, just like in the two sample proportion, the parameter we care about is the difference between two parameters, the average weight gain of those receiving the family treatment minus the average weight gain of those who don't. So we'll call that mu sub fam for family treatment and mu sub con for control treatment. The difference is the parameter that we are interested in. If it's positive, that means the family therapy is more effective than no therapy. If it's negative, it means it's less effective. And how big it is tells you the average effectiveness of this therapy. So we're going to give a confidence interval for that difference, and we're going to test the claim that it's positive or negative, or in this case, that it's different. Under the hood, what's going on is that you can prove that a certain statistic built out of the two sample means and the two sample standard deviations, and of course the sample sizes, follows a t-distribution with a certain number of degrees of freedom. The math here is truly complicated. Um, and quite unnecessary for doing the procedure. So here is a case where it really does make sense to pile all of that math into the template, which is what we will do. Here's how to use the template. I'll describe it, but of course I will show it to you in a moment. We'll use the two sample mean template, which is on the templates page of my web page. It is a numerical procedure, which is the second column. It is two samples in two populations, which is the second row. When you open it, it will look very much like the one sample mean template, same color scheme, same tabs. Um, it's to, it has a data tab, but now the data tab has two columns. You paste your two columns of data in columns A and B of the data tab. 
Again, you can paste them in either order. That is to say, either sample can be sample one. Um, you just have to keep track of which is which. And a good habit that will save you a little bit of pain and misery is always put the one that you expect to have the higher sample mean first. Okay? And as with the one sample mean, if you don't know the data, you know X bar, S, and N, you put that on the t-test tab and you check the use summary statistics checkbox. Then you go to the t-test tab, you enter the desired confidence level, and you read off the confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2 in the green box. If you're doing hypothesis test, there's only one null hypothesis that the two means are equal, just like with uh, two-sample proportion. And there are three alternate hypotheses. Mu1 is less than mu2, different from mu2, or greater than mu2. And you choose which one and read off the p-value from the green box. As always, our conclusion is expressed in the form. This data is or is not significant evidence at the alpha significance level that the average of whatever the variable is in population 1 is less than different from or greater than the average of the variable in population 2. As with two sample proportion, we can also view this procedure or use this procedure to test whether there's an association between a binary categorical variable and a numerical variable. So instead of viewing two populations, one numerical variable, we can again view a single population, a binary categorical variable which splits up the population, and a numerical variable. So then, once again, association will be interpreted as the there's a difference in the mean of those restricted to the first value versus the mean restricted to those in the second value. Literally, there being an association just means that the distributions are different, but the only difference that will ever really matter to us is a difference in the means. If we're relating a categorical and a numerical variable, we better to report the conclusion as this data is or is not significant evidence at the alpha significance level that the explanatory variable and the response variable are related or associated in the population. Assumptions, nothing new here. Same distinction as in two sample proportion. If you took a single sample from a combined population, that needs to be a simple random sample, and the large population needs to be true. If you took two distinct samples, they each need to be simple random samples of their separate distinct populations, and they have to be independent, and they each population needs to be 20 times its sample size. And finally, we have the rule 01540 rule. And in this case, we ask that each sample separately satisfy, sample and population separately, satisfy one of the three conditions of the 01540. They don't have to satisfy the same condition. All right, let's do our first example. Remember, we wanted a 95% confidence interval for the difference of the average weight gain for anorexic teen girls receiving the family therapy and for those receiving no therapy. And we're going to test the claim there is a difference in these means at the 5% significance level. We start with the null and alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the means are equal. The alternate is that they're different. So let's go and do that calculation. On my web page, I am first going to go to Data Files and scroll down to Anorexia Fixed. There's Anorexia is the original file that had some problems with it, so Anorexia Fixed is just the Excel is fixed. It's not actually claiming that Anorexia has been fixed. Um, let me show you this file. It's a little bit complicated. It has some interesting aspects to it. taking a little while to open up. When it opens up, you will see a bunch of columns. Remember, there are three treatments. Um, the control group. Here's the cognitive therapy treatment, which we're not talking about. The family therapy and the control group. In each case, you have each individual has their weight 
at the beginning and their weight at the end. And the last three columns, in a different order for some reason, give the weight gain. So for example, the first girl who received the control treatment started at 80.7 pounds, ended at 80.2, so she lost a half a pound. The first girl in the family therapy treatment, in contrast, went from 83.8 .8 pounds to 95.2 pounds, so she gained 11.4 pounds. Okay, so here these two columns are what matter. They're the weight gains in the two treatments. I'm expecting the therapy to be effective, so I'm going to guess that the family change is bigger, so I'm going to put it first. <clears throat> I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go back to the web page, go up to the main page, and over to Excel templates. I have a numerical variable, weight gain, and I have two samples. So I'm going to do the two sample mean. It's another T procedure. And I'm going to open that up. And as I said, it looks quite similar to the one sample mean. It's got three tabs. Eep. Oh, I seem to have double clicked on it. Sorry. It's got three tabs. T test tab looks somewhat familiar. The data tab now has two columns, A and B, because there's two samples. I'm going to put the family change into A, which it didn't like for some reason. And then I'm going to go back, get the control group, and paste it into B. And now I will look at the test. Up here, you can probably guess, if you're given X bar S and N for two samples, you can enter all that information here. You can put the titles in here, which is a good idea, so you can keep them straight. And you would click Use Summary Statistics. We don't. So we can go straight to the confidence interval. We enter the confidence level here. Various quantities that matter and that you may be asked for in problems online show up here. Degrees of freedom is what goes into this calculation of the T distribution, the difference of the sample means, that's our point estimate, x bar minus x1 bar minus x2 bar. Um, the standard error of the difference is what comes after the T score in the confidence interval. And here's our confidence interval. It's a confidence interval for the first mean minus the second mean. So this is how much more weight gained on average under the family therapy treatment than under the control. So if I had done it in the other order, I would have to say the sentence the other way around. And that confidence interval is 7.71 plus or minus 4.74. So plausible values for the difference in average weight gains can be anywhere from 2.97 to 12.46. Down here, I told you that the only null hypothesis was that the means were equal. In fact, you can take a different null hypothesis. The means are some fixed value. We never will. It's in there because it's no more complicated, so I thought I might as well stick it in the template, but we'll never use that. We can set our significance level if we like. All we have to do is set our alternate hypothesis. Our original question asked if there was a difference. It did not uh, propose a direction, so we read off the p-value is point. 00228. Returning, sure enough, our 95% confidence interval is 7.74 plus or minus 4.74, or 7.71 plus or minus 4.74. Our p value, 0 0.00228, is less than the significance level of 5%. So, we reward the confidence level as the 95% confidence interval for the difference in average weight gain between teen girls receiving the family therapy treatment and those who do not is 7.71 plus or minus 4.74. We report the significance level as this data is significant evidence at the 5% level that, the family, th that family therapy treatment is associated with weight gain in anorexic teen girls. The two variables are related or, perhaps better in this case, would be to say the data is significant evidence at the 5% level that the average weight gain of anorexic teen girls who receive the family therapy treatment is different from the average weight gain of those who do not. 
it seems worth at this point making a general comment, which is significant evidence for an effect does not mean that the effect is significant in the usual sense of making a big difference. In this case, we definitely had significant evidence that the family therapy treatment was effective, um, but if you look at reasonable values for how much additional weight the girls gained under this, it's anywhere from 3 pounds to 12 pounds, if you're looking at somebody whose weight is 80 pounds or somewhere even less, gaining 3, 4, 5, even 12 pounds is something, but it, it doesn't necessarily get them out of the woods, does not address all the health issues that may be arising. So you may very well say that that's significant evident, evidence for an insignificant effect. The significance refers to the evidence, not necessarily the size of the effect that you're seeing. Okay, let's check our assumption. Simple random sample. One sample, it was all the girls who came into the clinic in a given month, um, and, well, actually, it didn't say what it was, so it's not met, but in fact, it was all the girls that came into the clinic in a given month, so it is not met, certainly not a simple random sample, large population. Remember, it's a single sample, so we combine the 17 and the 26 in those two samples to get uh, 43, which means we would need there to be 860 anorexic teen girls in the world. That's met. 0, 15, 40. We don't know the weight gains are normal. Um, so that's not an option. The sample sizes, 17 and 26, are both between 15 and 40. So we have to look at the histograms. And let's do that. The histogram tab now contains two histograms. Um, they're carefully labeled, because it is important to keep these straight. There were 17 girls in the family therapy, and uh, I would describe that as pretty symmetric. Less clear-cut, there were 26 girls in the control group. I would describe that as moderately skewed. Uh, that's a judgment call. I would say the assumption is met. Uh, there's a little typo there, sorry. Uh, in particular, in practice, people tend to be more relaxed about the, this assumption in the two-sample mean because they view the, the two samples as kind of working together as one big sample. Uh, but in any case, that would be on the borderline, but I would say on the whole, that assumption is met. Let's do a second example. The file ebayauction.xls contains data called from sale, all sales in eBay during one month of a certain brand of PDA. I gave this example to you earlier, and I told you that they were iPhones, because I didn't think anybody would know what a PDA was anymore. But in fact, they were PDAs, personal digital assistants. They're iPhones that can't make a phone call. Uh, you know, in uh, eBay, there's two ways you can buy something. When you post something on eBay, you post a buy it now price. And if anyone's willing to pay that price, they can have it right away. Otherwise, People bid on the item, and by it at a certain time, the lowest bid wins the auction. Um, so column A is the price of all those sold using the buy it now option, and column B is all those sold to the highest bidder. You might reasonably think that people buying the buy it now are eager, willing to pay a higher price, um, and that therefore, when sales are made under the buy it now, they would be higher than when sales are made under a competitive bidding process. So let's see if that's true. Let's test the claim at the 5% significance level that the buy it now price is higher on average than the bidding price. And let's give a 95% confidence interval for the difference between the buy it now price and the bidding price and check the assumptions. Okay, so I, because that seemed to suggest that the buy it now price would be larger, I put the buy it now in column A, I put the bidding in column B, and I tested the claim that the mean for buy it now is greater than the mean for bidding, against the null hypothesis that they're equal, and in the two-sample mean template, I got a p-value of 0.4.
I'm not going to go through the example this time, but I will. you should stop and see that you get the same thing. This p-value is more than the significance level. Therefore, this data is not significant evidence at the 5% level that buy it now, the buy it now price is higher on average than the bidding price. I scrolled up to the confidence interval and uh, left it at 95% and I found that the 95% confidence interval for the difference in the average buy it now price and bidding prices for all PDAs sold on eBay is $1.96 plus or minus 16.05. You'll notice that that interval goes from about minus $14 to $18 and it includes lots of negative values. So that interval is telling you that a negative value for the difference is perfectly plausible, which is to say it's perfectly plausible that the buy it now is less than the bidding. So you can see the confidence interval and the uh, hypothesis test are closely related. Is it a simple random sample? No. It was all the PDAs sold in one month. So it's a convenient sample, large population. Yeah, there are no longer, but at the time there were presumably more than 500 PDAs sold on eBay. 0, 15, 40 rule. That's not met. We don't know the variable is normal, and both samples, or no, the first sample was less than 15, and if you look at the histogram, the second sample, which was just over 15, was very skewed. So we failed to meet that assumption. Uh, after watching this lecture, you should be able to find a confidence interval for the difference of two means using the template. You should be able to express it in a sentence that includes the confidence level, the population's variables, parameters, and point estimate, and margin of error as always. You should be able to choose null and alternate hypotheses for the two-sample mean procedure when the question addresses means in two different populations, and also when it addresses the relationship between a categorical and a numerical variable in a single population. You should be able to use the template to find the p-value and report your results in a sentence that includes the conclusion significance level, populations, variables, parameters, and the alternate hypothesis, either in the two-population language or in the two-variable language. You should be able to check the assumptions. Remember, this depends on whether the data was gathered as one sample or as two. This concludes the two-sample mean lecture.